Good morning, everybody. How we doing? It's Thursday. It's the Swick Show. How we doing, everybody? It's good to see you all. Um, I say see you all. Quite a few of us still looking, so I'm assuming you're still scramming down breakfast. <laughs> It's Thursday morning, it's half past nine, and we are here to bring you the Switch Show with awesome tips, advice, and help from peeps like us to take a firm, solid step into and boost your online coaching, mentorship, or teaching program. So hello, everybody in the chat room. Hi to those of you watching this back later on, and of course, those of you on the podcast. I hope you've got your pens and paper ready today because we've got Mr. Alex Smell for part two of our awesome uh, offer value series. So this is what separates a £500 offer from a 5k offer. Morning Alex, how are you doing buddy? I'm good, how are you? I'm good man, good. Excellent, excellent. So yeah, we are getting into it today. Just gonna peel back the onion layers a bit and dive into what really makes a great coaching program. Because I've spent a lot of money on various coaching programs and normally spend anywhere between 100 150,000 a year on coaching programs so i've seen the good i've seen the bad i've seen the yeah and uh yeah i want to show you what i believe to be is the real winning formula to adding loads and loads of value without adding loads of overhead to your business to deliver a great service for your clients and also to have an enjoyable business to run so if that sounds good we can get into that and then Get also before there, we jump in any yeah. further, we want to um, talk about the next challenge coming up, um, which is happening on the 31st of March. So you guys want to get um, your tickets for that. Uh, these challenges are going really, really well. People are making massive shifts, huge leap forwards with their offers. So if you're one of those people that um, would love to have an online coaching business but don't know what you could coach on this is exactly what you need so it's uh just 27 dollars for the time being it's probably give me the last chance to get it for this price because things are going to be changing in the next week or two and uh it's going to start being quite a bit more expensive so if you want to do the challenge it's probably a last chance to get it for 27 dollars. it's going to be more like 200 300 dollars um from the next one after that so don't miss it. You get personal feedback from yours truly, um, all about your offer and help you to shape it into something really, really valuable. Um, so grab your tickets there. And yeah, it's a really good thing to do. So check it out. And what's been going on with Ali Temple? Has he been fighting again? I'm Scottish, so all we do is walk around and brawl in the street. <laughs> Drunk. <laughs> no, as um, anyone who's been on my social media might have noticed, I've gone back to martial arts to get out my brain and in my body because it's good on so many levels. And I thought, when I'm on camera a lot, so I won't do like MMA or boxing because I'm just going to get my baby face punched all the time and that's not a strong look on camera. So I went to Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and still managed to get my lip burst, my face bruised, I'm covered in bruises. Um, so there you go. It was a little bit of cross-facing as someone was trying to choke the life out of me. But uh, you, apart from that, you know, it's going really well. Out. You know, martial arts are all about defending yourself, yeah? It's basically got a... <laughs> well, I, I know, I did it for a long time. I did nine years of karate, two years of jiu-jitsu from a, from a sins. Yeah, when I did a lot of boxing and kickboxing and traditional martial arts when I was younger that got me into the acrobatics that then got me into the performing. And so I wanted just something brand new. And grappling I was always a little bit rubbish at. And, uh, you know, the, the guys that train up there are all like proper lads, like tough, hairy, mm. early guys. And so I turn up all groomed and clean cut and I've just basically been getting murdered for the last two months. But I've been quite enjoying it. Oh, cool. sounds so. loads of fun. <laughs> <laughs> Brilliant. I was, I was a judo man myself. Ooh, nice. Quite good at rolling around. <laughs> a lot of man hugging. So other than other than tales of being beaten up by burly men, what have you got for us today, buddy? Uh, yeah, sorry, I forgot I wasn't here just here for a social. <laughs> uh, I was going to talk today about money mindset. Money mindset, um, because it's a really important thing to get right on a number of reasons, and more importantly, is as a coach, that conversation comes up almost all the time whenever I'm coaching someone on their business. And it is probably right up there in the top two or three 
areas that I see the most limiting beliefs, most limiting mindset in. Now, I'll reiterate this throughout the little presentation, but if you have a negative association to something, you're not going to move forward towards it. So as business owners, we need to get our money mindset right um, so that we can attract and earn lots of that good stuff so we can get to the land of milk and honey, as Alex calls it, which I'm all about. Uh, so yeah, I'll just jump in. Uh, let me open my notes because I, I did take some. Uh, all right, so why does this money matter? So um, really, it's an ex essential component of making more money is about freedom. And there's probably a very common reason that a lot of us are here is because we value freedom, freedom of choice, location freedom, financial freedom, um, to be spontaneous, to make decisions, as well as protect us against unforeseen events. Um, and so, yeah, the ability to do what you want, when you want, where you want, and maybe who you want to do it with. Money is simply about having the means to do more of the stuff that you love to do. And so money matters. But as I said in that little intro, it is one of the areas that has the most limiting psychology around it. Poor financial education often means that people hold on to really negative views around money, which in turn means they avoid talking about it and uh, trying to make a lot of it. I actually remember, vividly remember, I was, uh, I think I was on a ski trip or something and we're in a catered chalet, lots of different people and people were kind of going back and forward and there was alcohol and that. So people just kind of speak in their mind. And uh, I remember something was said and someone says, yeah, well, you just don't speak about it. It's religion and money. You shouldn't speak about those things. And I was thinking, well, how do you advance your understanding of complicated things if you don't speak about them? So that really, really stuck with me. And it was really the kind of a real example of, ah, okay, there's, there, if, if people aren't willing to talk about tough stuff, then you never learn about it, understand it, and develop a better way of looking at it. And that's certainly the case with money. It goes without saying that this isn't about making you a better person. I don't think that money makes you a better person, doesn't make you better than anyone else. It probably just makes you a little bit more of what you already are. So if you're thoughtful, kind, considerate, generous, and love to contribute, you've got more means to do that. If you're a little bit of a meanie, then you're maybe just going to be a little bit meanier with your money. Um, so as I said, if you have any limiting belief systems, any limiting psychology around it, you're going to put this barrier between where you are now and where you're trying to get to. And I see this in clients all the time. I kind of say, okay, what's your goals? How much are you looking to make? All that sort of stuff. And say, well, okay, well, I need enough money to survive and I want to do some of the nice things, but, but not too much. You know, I don't want to be greedy. And it's like, ah, okay, right. I, just by those two simple statements, I've already got a pretty good sense of what your relationship with money might be. Financial freedom is really, really important because it simply allows you freedom of choice, more options, it allows you to gather new experiences and the quality of your life is the quality of your experiences. It also provides you with security and certainty. You know, like your roof might fall in, your boiler might break, your car might pack in. Um, there's certainly a lot of instability in the world. You might be thinking about remortgaging your house just to fill up your car. And uh, again, that is a challenge. There is many, many challenges in front of us when it comes to the monetary system and finances and things like that. But what you'll see more and more and more on uh, social media and things like that now is people falling into a scarcity mindset. And understandably, so there's no judgment on that, but a scarcity mindset causes people to shrink and retract. Well, oh, I better save my money. I better not go do this. So I'm worried about that. And it's, it's a very disempowering mindset that will prevent you from getting bold and taking action and doing pursuing big goals or going out there and living your life and so yeah a little bit more money is going to provide you with additional security and certainty that's a, a good thing to have it's also going to allow you to contribute and provide i don't know how many of you guys seen this but a couple of months ago uh, alex and his partner shared their kind of charity their projects out in africa that they do and it just it absolutely lit me up it was so inspiring it really resonated with me a lot and um, i'm not at that stage but i thought god yeah like when I get the business doing what I want it to do and that money's coming in, it gives me more options. It gives you more options and more opportunity to contribute to things that are meaningful to you, whether it be a charitable thing, an organization setting something up, or simply providing those around you with additional opportunities and support. 
more money, more options. Allows you to solve problems. I know that that might uh, seem a little bit like, you know, we've all got that kind of negative cliche that it's like, yeah, just pay for that to go away. But in some respect, and I'm not talking about breaking the law or being uh, uh, immoral or anything like that, but if you've got more money, you can solve more problems. You can solve bigger problems or even just annoying problems. Like, yeah, just, just pay for that and get it done and, you know, get fix it and get it to go away. You don't have to drain your energy or lose time or get bogged down by problems. You can solve them if you've got more means to do so. And as Alex said uh, right there at the beginning as well, is invest in yourself. This is maybe one of the most important ones. If you're kind of just living uh, month to month, you know, don't really have enough money, that sort of stuff, and an opportunity comes along to do like a course or a challenge or a program or something like that to develop yourself, and you think, oh, I don't really have the money, you're not going to be able to grow in the areas that you want to. And as you guys, uh, with the income you've got, if you've got a good income or the additional income that you're going to be making from the Sell What You Know program is think about what percentage of that do you want to invest in you? You certainly need to invest some of it into the business, but what do you want to invest into you? Where or how do you want to grow as a business owner, as an individual, uh, maybe as a partner, uh, in any other area of your life? Having a lack of money, in my opinion at least, is not a good thing because it actually is going to create a huge amount of stress. If you remember maybe times where you've struggled to pay the bills and you live in paycheck to paycheck and, you know, uh, MOTs, cars, insurance, that sort of stuff, you get absolutely stressed out your mind. And stress is not only very unfun, it compromises you mentally and emotionally. It's actually one of the worst things for your health as well. You stop digesting, you uh, have a higher chance of having heart attacks, all of that sort of stuff, just to keep it cheery. Uh, you know, when you're stressed, it is not a good place to be. And a lack of money is one of the primary causes of stress. It's also, I think, one of the top causes of uh, divorce as well. Um, it's going to cause you to make poor decisions because you're literally firefighting. It's going to give you a lack of options, so you're going to feel trapped. It's going to be anxiety-inducing. And as always, you're going to have less ability to invest in yourself and your development. So this isn't just money for money's sake. Let's understand a little bit more about what money really, really is. Because being financially literate is about understanding what money is and how to use it effectively to enhance the quality of your own life and those round about you. Poor financial literacy results in you, in you perceiving money and the people who accumulate a lot of it negatively. Having limiting associations, again, is going to prevent you from moving forward to getting it or to keep it. So three simple things that money is. Number one, money is just an exchange of value. It's an exchange of energy. There's this thing that you want, and you've got these resources, these energy tokens called money, and you go, I would like to have that thing, and I'm willing to exchange these tokens, these little units of energy to have that thing. It's an exchange of value. So you might be thinking, how on earth am I gonna be able to charge five or even 10,000 pounds for my coaching offer? when you offer it to someone who values it to that extent. Um, number two, money is a reflection of the value that is delivered to the marketplace. Now, um, we talk about, you know, so my partner, for example, works in care. She basically keeps people alive. And for that, she, I think, paid about 20 pence more an hour, more than minimum wage. Now, she's keeping people alive. Is there a more important thing to do? Well, there's not many if there is. And so, but she gets paid basically minimum wage where I get, I earn probably 10 times more than that. Should I be getting paid 10 times more and she's keeping people alive? Well, it's not as simple as that. It's if you do something that adds a lot of value to the marketplace, for example, a business say pays you £10,000 for a program, and as a result, they make £100,000 over the rest of the year as a byproduct of that, they've taken that experience, the knowledge, the skills, the coaching, and they've taken it to the marketplace, and there has been a return on that investment. Or maybe it creates a new bit of technology, a bit of infrastructure, um, so on and so forth. You get what I'm saying. And so... You can also think about it as, like, okay, someone stocks a shelf and they get paid minimum wage for that. It's not that that's a lesser person. It's not that that's a lesser human being. Of course it's not. It's that kind of anyone could go in and stock that shelf, relatively speaking. Whereas if you're very niche, 
is a, a, like a heart surgeon, for example, that's a really, really niche thing to do. And so if they're niching in that area, there's less people doing it. And the, the knowledge, the standard, the ability is higher. So again, they're going to get paid more money. It's as simple as that. I'm not saying it's right. It's just the way the system is. I don't have a problem with it, but some people do. The third thing that money is, is a reflection of the volume of people that you have impacted. So let's take music, for example. Uh, Beyonce releases a single. Even if she only makes like a dollar per single, she's still selling millions and millions and millions of those units. And so, you know, should a sports star or a rock star or a musician be getting, like footballers get paid like stupid money now, what is like 500 grand a week and things like that? Cool. That's because there is millions and millions and millions of people willing to pay tickets or pay-per-views or sit down and watch football. It's a reflection of the volume of people they have impacted. So if you want to make more money, positively impact, help, serve, support, um, or add value to more people. So it's an exchange of value, a reflection of the value delivered to the marketplace, and a reflection of the volume of people that you have positively impacted. Now, another rule that's important to get right when it comes to money is you, you, you see this kind of anti-rich rhetoric on social media quite a lot. And it's like, oh, you should take all the money off the rich people and redistribute it to everyone else. It's like, ah, OK, but do you want the general public having vast resources of wealth or do you want the most intelligent, most creative, most industrious people to have vast resources that can then put that into technology and resources and infrastructure and things like that. The reality is that even if you took all that money from all the wealthiest people and redistributed it evenly all around the world, within probably just a couple of years, mostly the same amount of people would have that money again. And here's the reason for that. Money flows to those who value it most, which is why if you don't care about money, Nine times out of 10, you don't really have any of it. And you've probably got a, a friend that's just like terrible with their money. They just get it and it just evaporates. They're just always spending it on random stuff. Now, if they're happy, great, more power to them. But because they don't value it, they don't acquire it and they don't make that money work for them. So this is especially relevant in your discovery calls, your sales calls or your consultations. Some of you might think there's a little bit of resistance or it might feel, sorry, a little bit of resistance to asking for the sale, for asking for money. And so one of the things that you have to get right is kind of say, well, who's got my money? I need that money because there's things that I need to do with it. I am valuing that money. And if I value that money and place a high level of importance on serving that client to the highest level, there's an exchange of value there. I need to value both the service that I give them, but I also need to value the money that they're giving me because if I value it, it will flow to me eventually. So money flows to those who value it most. Last three things I'll say, three top tips that you need to know and practice around your money. Number one, you need to know how to make it. That's a big part of what we're teaching people how to do here on the Sell What You Know program is take all the stuff that's in there, package it, present it to people that say, yes, I would love that. Here's some money for it. So you've made some money. Great. Now, what do you do? The answer is not run around spending it on cars and boats and holidays. You should do some of that, probably, maybe. But it's it's not the first thing that you should do. Because one, you've made money. Great. Most people go, oh, look at all this money. And then they've got no money left. The second thing that you need to know how to do is how to keep a hold of it. And so that's about being very, very intentional and mindful about where you allocate and distribute your monies Two, if it's something that just immediately depreciates in value, probably not the best way to spend it. And so number three, you need to know how to multiply your money. And that's the real kind of, that's the real rub. That's the real secret sauce is a lot of people keep money, save it in a bank. If you've had a lot of money squirreled away in a bank account right now, over the last two years, especially because of the quantitative easing, the money printing, that money that you had in the bank that you're really, really happy about has now lost lots of its value because there's more money in circulation. There's more inflation. So the spending power or purchasing power of those savings is now massively reduced, which is part of the reason why I never sit on cash. It's all in cash flowing, appreciating assets, uh, property and crypto and things like that. And so 
You need to keep it, but just letting it sit in a savings account is probably not the most effective use of it because over time, inflation ultimately erodes the value of that money. So step three, you need to know how to multiply it. That's investing in cash flow and assets, appreciating assets, but within the context of where we are is pumping that money back into your business. Maybe it's building a team. It's probably certainly investing more and more into your marketing. If you've got a, a campaign that's actually producing really good results, pump more money into that and scale that campaign so that you can then make more money, keep more of that money and reinvest more of that money back into your business, yourself, building a team if you choose to do so, and ultimately setting yourself up with additional assets that positively cash flow to essentially make you financially free. I would absolutely and invite uh, and recommend if you, some of you guys are probably already really financially literate, part of why you're here, but if you're not, if anything I've said around this has rung true, um, a really popular book that changed a lot of my money mindset was Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Um, really common, popular book. Most business owners have probably encountered it at some point. I, before I read that book, was really into the arts, I was into theatre, I was a performer, I kind of made okay money, but especially back when I was younger and in theatre, I was like, money's the root of all evil, rich people are idiots, they're greedy, they're all that sort of stuff, so I was always broke. I read Rich Dad, Poor Dad, and then I read a book called The Complete Guide to Property Investing, because my mindset had completely shifted. From those two books, five and a half years later, I went from normal average money to have an over a million pounds worth of property in a portfolio and so that was five or six years just off two books a bunch of podcasts and that is just the example of how you can completely change your circumstances i had very limiting negative beliefs around money didn't have a lot of it as a result then i changed my relationship with money changed my mindset with money got a little bit more informed and educated and then implemented those rules about making it keeping it and multiplying it and has completely changed um, my financial position as a, re as a result. You're going to need to get your money mindset right in order to essentially make sales. But what I would say is if you have resistance to that, switch out selling for serving and add as much value as you can. And the money will be an exchange of that value and a reflection of the people's lives and businesses who you're positively impacting. And that is it. Thank you very much indeed for listening. Absolutely fun. I love the concept of money being energy tokens. Mm. And fun the, the, tokens, the, I call them. Yeah, man. I, lo I love that because, yeah, you, you, you're, you're not so much selling a product as offering the service. And like you say, the money is a, is a rather positive byproduct. <laughs> exactly that. Exactly that. Awesome, awesome. Thank you very much, Jay. That was brilliant. Absolutely Thank brilliant. You. Um, yeah, I was I was a money evaporator for many years. Very much. <laughs> but yeah, mindset's changed and, and yeah, so has my stress level. <laughs> awesome. So, Alex, I'm excited. Yo. I'm looking forward to this. Even I've got my pen and Let's paper ready. get into it. Alrighty then. Yeah, so on the last one of these, this is kind of a two-parter. On the last one of these, we just talked about the essentials of a high-ticket um, program. Let me just make sure I'm showing that screen here, gang. Um, and really that comes down to um, some one-to-one -one time course content, maybe a Facebook group and group calls. That tends to be the essentials and that's what most of you will need to um begin with when the online coaching business and have for quite a while really but over all the years i've been doing this and all the uh coaching programs that i've experienced and been a part of as well as the ones i've run as well as the ones i've helped people to build um you tend to get a good sense of what makes a really great online coaching program you know the real essence of it and um the sell what you know program has been built very much in the image of a reaction to all of the bad experiences that i've had um while spending sometimes tens of thousands of pounds on online coaching programs such as um you know a lot of programs you will hand over your credit card pay for a program and then 
not hear anything from anyone for a few days while their support or admin team catches up and gets you set up and onboarded and remembers to send you some logins and things like that. And if you're of a nervous disposition, handing over thousands of pounds or dollars to someone on the internet that you've never met before, and then they go quiet for free uh, for a few days, I can imagine that that would um, be quite worrisome for a lot of people. So things like that aren't a great uh, a great experience, and we want to make sure that we are doing the polar opposite of that. And also, we did a program where they profess to have a specialty in um, creating the best possible client experience within a coaching program. But yet, the first thing they asked me to do was to spend a couple of hours filling out this sheet of theirs to put down all of our numbers and metrics and conversion rates and everything like that. And they said to me, yeah, fill all this in. And then at the end of the program, fill it in on the right-hand side so you can see how much better the numbers are and how good we are um, and how much we've helped you. And I was like, so you basically give me four hours of work just to show yourselves how great you are. And that was a company specializing in creating a better client experience. And that was an awful client experience. Um, We've had uh, an experience with a sales company where um, as soon as we joined, they assumed we had nothing else to do but do their program, the entire team. And they gave us ridiculous amounts of things to do all in their interest, not in our interest at all. They made us go through these training exercises and we had to complete tests at the end of every video to prove that we'd actually watched it well enough. And um, they gave us a to-do list every single day, every single person on the team. Um, It was just horrible, absolutely horrible to the point where I had to tell them explicitly in these words, leave my team alone. We've paid you for this. This is all I want. Leave my team alone. Oh, but we've got these, te- these meetings booked with your team. Leave them alone. You do not have my permission to contact my team any further. Can you imagine like having a program that creates that kind of reaction from one of your clients where you're having to be told to leave their team alone because you've been so invasive and upset everyone and given them pointless things to do. So I am always very hot on client experience. Client experience is everything here at Sell What You Know. It's something we really pride ourselves on. The team will tell you I am absolutely biting the heads off if anyone in any way, shape or form has done something to create a negative client experience. Or if, you know, the team are great actually, so it's not like they they do that. But if ever we see... um, something creating that in the process or the system then as a team we work on how we can fix that very very quickly because it is so important client experience is everything everything and yeah you want to do a good job for your clients and make sure that they get the best they possibly can so um i don't know why but i can't see you guys how do you see everyone uh oh here they are Found you. There you go. <laughs> Happy to help. <laughs> okay, so um, everyone's seen my screen. See the big logo at the minute, yeah? So how can we add value yeah, without we'll get- adding overhead, yeah? And by the way, gang, jump in with questions as we go. I don't mind. So first thing is onboarding. So like I was just saying, the first few minutes after someone pays you a critical not hours not days minutes so sell what you know we have a very strict rule that um everyone needs to get something from us like logins and uh any you know paperwork or anything like that within an hour of joining within an hour not four days not three days within an hour and in practice it's almost instantaneous immediate or normally within five or ten minutes something like that Um, because you want to make sure that people feel like I just did a good thing. Not, oh my God, what have I just done? So that's important. And then also when people join your program, they are absolutely well and truly confused. You kind of think, oh yeah, all they've got to do is do this and jump on this. It's so easy, but we've never done it before. And perhaps this is their first ever online program. 
you have to assume everyone knows absolutely nothing, even if you've literally just explained everything to them. Because a lot of the time you'll perhaps you know, make the sale and you've got a new client and you have a nice chat and then you're walking them through what happens next. They are just like shell shocked about what they've done. They are not listening to a single word you're saying. They go, uh huh, yeah, all right, yeah, whatever. Information. So you have to assume that even though you've just told them everything, they still know nothing. They still know nothing. So in any important information that you're giving people when they join you, you normally have to give it to them three or four different ways and different times in different formats. So we um, tell them. So the advisors will walk them through what happens next. We will also email them with clear instructions. And then they will join an onboarding call where Rochelle or one of the client success team will then explain it all again to them so that they're really crystal clear. And then again, it's in the online portal. So they can read it again. So we do it four three four times over to make sure that everyone knows exactly what they're doing and it's really not complicated and nice and straightforward they know what to click on they know what to do they know how to get help and by doing that you just make it way less scary way less nerve-wracking and therefore more enjoyable because you want everyone to have just the best time you want people to have an awesome experience it's not just about like okay you sign up with me i'm going to blast your brain with information to solve your problem like create an amazing experience for people you want people feeling like oh my god this is this is like the best thing i've ever done like this is so cool this isn't just like you know with us how to build an online coaching program this is bloody amazing like this is so cool i'm really like having a totally different experience to anything i've ever had before so onboarding is really really important so make sure you do a stand-up job of that and just reassure, reassure, triple check everyone, you know, knows what they're doing, give them plenty of opportunities to ask questions and navigate those first few days, because it takes people a bit of time to just adjust. Um, and yeah, client experience, so leading on beyond that, that's kind of the first experience of good client experience, but that mantra should run through absolutely everything in your program. So you're always thinking about the client first and you second. So absolutely everything you ask them to do is in their interest, never yours. Don't be getting them to do big long sheets to fill in to just talk about how great your program is and what great results they've got ever. Don't be getting them to do training or watch videos or anything like that that is in any way, shape or form not in their interest. I've made that mistake. A classic one I, everyone knows I talk about is when I had my first coaching program helping photographers. And the very first thing I got them to do was to list out every piece of equipment they had so that I knew what they had so I could help them to take better pictures. So it's useful for me to know that. And that was not cool. So don't do that. If you don't need to know something, you don't need to get them to do something. They don't need to learn something really. Don't do it. Accountability. Hands up, who's lazy? You liars. <laughs> Everyone's lazy. Everyone can't be bothered to do things. Everyone thinks, oh, it's so difficult, Alex. I, I need to think about it a bit. I need to think about it a lot, actually. In fact, I need to overthink it massively for three weeks before I even do anything at all, because it needs to be perfect, Alex. It needs to be perfect before I do a single thing, before I type a single letter. It needs to be perfect. I cannot do it, Alex. So accountability is the stick the big gentle stick that you beat your clients with because it's good to have the carrot you know the land of milk and honey that they all want but if you don't have the stick to beat them with through the program most of them won't actually get to the end so accountability is a big part of what we do here at so we have several layers of accountability 
And again, this is all easy enough to add in. So the first level of accountability is the 90 day video journey. Super simple. Everyone should add this into their programs. It's great. Um, and all you're doing is you're asking them to film a little video every single day for 90 days, the majority of your program or your time together. Um, they will moan and scream and whine about, you know, why it's such a massive job and everything like that. At the beginning, they will say, oh, I don't do it. I don't like being on camera. I don't like the way I look on camera. Don't make me do Alex. I'm no good on camera. I've never been on camera. I don't do camera. All this stuff. So we force people to do it. So I'm pretty ruthless. I say, if you don't do it, I'll kick you out of everything. I don't care. Go and cry to mummy. But, and everyone does the same thing. First video, hello, this is a video that I made. I'm Alex. Don't know what to talk about every single time. But then by day 90, they're like, da, 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 this is the Alex show. Welcome. Today's subjects are ding, 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 full of value. All this kind of stuff. Because practice makes perfect. And when you realize, when you get out of your own head and go, actually, this isn't that hard at all. This is really easy. It's just a video. It's only my face. No one really cares. You make a huge shift. And by having to check in every day, knowing that I'll ruthlessly kick you out of everything if you even miss one day, because I'm horrible, you show up, right? And you do it and you get on with it. By pin that, you have amazing accountability. It keeps that consistency all the way through the program. Because otherwise people drift off it. Oh, I haven't bothered for a couple of days. I just won't ever bother again. <laughs> So just by having everyone just check in, even for a couple of minutes every single day, dum, 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 gets people in a really good rhythm for success. And they take action, they get on with it, and it keeps them in the group. It also is good for us to keep an eye on people to see if they're struggling or you know, not doing so well, so we can jump in and help them. Um, but it's just a really great thing to do. And the best thing of all is it brings everyone together as a community because everyone's commenting and watching each other's videos and helping each other out and reassuring each other and because there's ups and downs you know this is life so everyone helps each other through the, the highs and lows of this journey which is just amazing to see really powerful so it's an absolute must that one um accountability team so we put everyone into a team when they join the program normally five or six people also joining similar sort of time as them and they all hold each other accountable so they meet once a week each week they have a different team captain who takes turns and it's really simple. They all tell each other what they're going to get done for that week, what they did do or didn't do the week before. Um, and by doing that, by telling other people what they're going to get done, they know that they've got until the next accountability meeting to get it done. Otherwise they're going to look a bit daft. So they know they've got to get on with it. And um, yeah, it really helps to push people uh, forward. And then some people do, um, buddy up with just one person on their accountability team or they have just accountability buddy it's a bit more of an optional thing it's more of a personal choice um but that tends to happen naturally quite a bit and then we have an accountability group call so ali and jay from the team will <clears throat> um uh just host all the team captains so the team captains will report to the rest of the community what the team's up to what you know how everyone's doing um, so you have that kind of second lock-in. And then also we have Brooke, who um, is the accountability supervisor. So she's making sure that the accountability teams are set up the right way, that it's a positive experience. Everyone is, you know, um, getting the help they need. We have ears on the ground to make sure no one's kind of drifting off without us knowing about it. We can fix things really, really quickly because you want that constant feedback as well. If you close your ears and eyes about your program, um you can get it really wrong so the more feedback you can possibly get the better and always act on it as well don't say, oh yeah 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 it's because you don't know what you're doing that's why you're saying it's bad if someone's saying it's bad somewhere some reason some for some why you don't necessarily understand it might be and you need to look at that and try and make it better so i always come from a place of uh they're right i'm wrong 
by default. Always. Time. So we kind of touched quickly, on this. Sorry, Alex. Just yeah. very quickly, um, Sarah's popped her hand up. I'm wondering if it had something to do with the last topic. Are you there, Sarah? Sarah? Sarah, if you put your questions in the chat, that'd be good because I can see it here. So I'm keeping my eye on it. So if anyone's got any questions, stick them in the chat as we go. And if I, you know, we're talking about this, that thing, then I'll dive deeper. Um, so yeah, time. Time is the most valuable asset, right? So you've always, like I've been saying, got to respect people's time and give them as much time as possible and understand that they don't have much of it to put into your program. So you always want to design your program uh, very much around the amount of time that they're realistically going to be able to give. Now, everyone's different. So some people will take forever to do something and some people will just whiz through it in no time at all. So it doesn't matter what you do. You'll always have people saying, oh, there's not enough time, Alex, no enough time to do it. But then you're always kind of keeping a, a vibe on like how, um, how many or how much of that you get, right? But of course, you know, people are whizzing through it and, you know, doing things quickly. But generally speaking, you want to try and keep that in a medium kind of level. So if you never hear anyone saying that they haven't got, you know, enough time, then potentially there's not enough to do or there's too much time, not a real problem to have. But yeah, you, it's the general um, vibe of things. So that's something we focus on a lot. So what you know is constantly tuning things. Sometimes it's streamlining exercises. Sometimes it's giving them a bit more time. Sometimes it's, um, you know, a combination of all of those things. Um, and always encouraging people just to get on with it, not overthink things. Because overthinking is where the bulk of people's time goes, um, not actual execution. Um, Dr. Con says, what if Facebook does not let you log in? I don't know what you mean there. Um, bonuses and guarantees. So we teach five pillar um, structure to your offer so you have your five core pillars it's just because it's easy to understand you can communicate a lot of value it doesn't feel too overwhelming um, but everything after that is a bonus so within so you know we have a lot of bonus modules and uh, extras a lot of what we just talked about but ali's here so one of the bonus modules is his coaching skills so we have help people to be able to coach people more effectively um, being better on camera, things like that. So anything you can add in um, that is, you know, in addition to your five pillars is good. And why this is good is especially good when you're pitching your offer because you'll pitch your offer with your five pillars and name your price and then let people just sit in that about that. And people will kind of start then associating, you know, evaluating whether that investment is worth those pillars worth the content of the program and then you can jump in with the bonuses and then all of a sudden the value proposition shifts drastically they're getting a lot more on top a lot more value for the same investment and therefore it's an easier decision and that will get people off of the fence and into action mode to, to actually execute on it because they're getting so much and you should always over deliver massively on everything as well we always do that we always hugely over deliver because that's really important to do now bonuses should solve perceived problems make things easier faster cheaper save them time or effort shortcut them to success and they shouldn't add work or be irrelevant to the core offer or confuse them or feel pointless and superfluous. You've got to be really valuable. And you can do all sorts of stuff. Um, checklists, tools, modules, examples, case studies, templates, email sequences, additional time, groups, historical content, you name it. And we, to a large extent, do a lot of these. And yeah, what we're doing is you're using those bonuses to add some sizzle to your offer.
and in guarantees to guarantee the outcome of your program wherever you can. So there's a couple of different types of guarantee, conditional and unconditional. So we have um, both of these guarantees in different areas of our business. So unconditional guarantees, something, you know, the classic one is a no quibble 30 day money back guarantee. So no matter what, if you don't like it, have your money back within 30 days, no questions asked. They're good for low ticket products. So we have that kind of guarantee on our challenge. So the, the challenge dropped um, today, $27, no quibble 30 day money back guarantee. Um, typically low involvement products and low commitment. So you wouldn't have an unconditional, well, it's up to you, but I wouldn't recommend having an unconditional uh, 30 day money back guarantee on a high ticket coaching program because you invest a huge amount of your time and energy and effort with every client that you have. There's a, a much bigger cost to you. And also um, it's important that people are committed to the journey. Because if they can just come in, waste your time, not be in the right state, not be very committed, they can destroy your business. So for that, you would have a conditional guarantee. So you guarantee a certain result. So we guarantee the, um, in fact, we have two guarantees. So we have one guarantee. The first guarantee is that we guarantee you will at least make back your investment in uh, us, in the program. And then a second guarantee that so long as you've launched by 18 weeks, we'll keep working with you for as long as it takes until you're making at least £10,000 a month. But two conditions. So we guarantee your return on investment. But obviously, we can't guarantee you're going to make that kind of money if you don't do anything. So we guarantee you'll get that return. You guarantee you'll get that money for sure. But of course, you've got to complete the program and follow our advice. If you don't complete the program and follow our advice, you're not going to be doing the right things. You're not going to get to that place. So I can't guarantee it if you don't do that. It's pretty obvious. It's very fair very straightforward but what a powerful guarantee to have because remember gang you're always selling a result you're not selling your course materials you're not selling your time you're not selling the program you're selling the result that they want so for us the result that we sell is a successful online coaching business no matter what you work with us that's what you get come hell or high water no ifs no buts that's what we're doing and in all the time we've been doing this, we've never once had anyone uh, claim that refund. Because we make sure we get people results. And we do everything in our power to make that happen. And conditional guarantees are great for those high ticket products where you have a lot more involvement, more commitment. And that way, everyone is duly committed to the journey. So guarantee the result that they want. Give them absolutely everything. That's it. It's pretty simple. Awesome. <laughs> Bit of a short one today, but yeah. Hit me with the questions, right. gang. We've got one from Lisa on Facebook. She says, uh, would you give an incentive to your clients regarding accountability? EJ, EJ, send a picture to the group of your achievements. Then if they post so many times, um, they get something, a gold star or a, a reward of some description. So when we first started the accountability um, system, I want to call it, I don't need a better word than system, but what do you reckon? Um, experience, the accountability experience. Ooh. So what you know, the initial idea we had prizes. So there's monthly prizes for the teams that took the most action and um, all that kind of stuff. 
No one gave a toss. Yeah. Like literally no one cared at all. It was, we were like, all right, we won't bother doing that. If anything, like it was a negative. Yeah. So we just stopped because no one was interested in that at all. <laughs> they would, but they would love the fact that they had that accountability. So yeah, that that's the real value in it. And yeah, you, we tried and failed with incentivizing it. It just wasn't necessary really. But I, the original idea we felt probably as you did that, well, if we added in this extra layer of prizes each month, then that would be, you know, really powerful. Um, but yeah, in practice, it's just not necessary. Uh, got one here from Anthony. How do you decide whether your high ticket or what, sorry, how do you decide whether your high ticket offer should be priced at one, two, three or 5k, for example, you hear some experts saying things like just double your price in a way that suggests that this is an easy and obvious thing to do with virtually no downside. It would be great to get how, uh, hear your take on this. Yeah. So pricing is something you feel your way into. So, um, and there's lower limits. So you want to charge at least a thousand pounds per client just so that the marketing numbers work really well and you're tripling your money because it will typically cost you anywhere between three and 500 pounds to acquire a client. If you do paid advertising, at least, um, obviously it's nowhere near that if you're doing organic marketing. Um, and that's great. And some people stick at that for a long time. It really depends on the value proposition, but Generally speaking, if you can get a thousand pounds consistently for your program, uh, then more likely you can get two thousand. So, in that instance, yeah, you would double your price to say two thousand. Now, as you go along, when you start, it's, it's harder because you've got no testimonials yet, you've got no proof, you don't really know what you're doing, and so <clears throat> the experience that people get, <clears throat> excuse me, then is. Um, it's quite different to when your program is more matured and you've got lots of proof to back up um, the fact that your program works and you want to be proactive with that and make sure you're, you're gathering that information, interviewing past clients and capturing when they write you emails and things like that. Um, that makes your program easier to sell and therefore you can sell it for more. And generally speaking, you, you want to go in a process of increasing your price and getting up to 3000 at least generally speaking especially if you had some help from us to build your offer we will generally build your offer to be worth that from the get-go so the pain and the value is big enough to be justifiably worth three thousand pounds that's always our um our goal with that not always some people's offers are just you know, because they're niche or whatever, it's always going to be a struggle. And I always tell them that it's like, this is a good offer, but I think you will always struggle to get it much past a thousand pounds, something like that. Um, but yeah. And so when you're up to 3000, then you're getting into what we call the close rate. That's your, your indicative figure. So that means the number of people you speak to on a, a sales call, the percentage of those people that actually go on to become a client. And so your target for that is about 30%, 25 to 30%. So if you're closing 50, 60% at 3,000 pounds, then you know you're too cheap and you can increase the price. But what happens is you increase your price, your confidence drops, you think no way is anyone going to pay me 4,000 pounds for it. And so that comes across in your next sales call. So your close rate goes through the floor, no one buys from you, everything is a disaster, land of uh, pain and misery. Um, and then someone will pay you that money. And like, this is amazing, back in the land of milk and honey, um, and your confidence grows, and then your close rate comes back up. And so you, you end up going in this kind of uppy downy cycle where you're increasing your price, close rate goes down, then you start making sales at that price, close rate comes back up again, you get used to that price really is how it feels. So you then your close rate goes up to say 50% again. So you think, okay, I'll increase the price again, and so on. And then after a while, you keep doing that, and then you start to see, okay, actually, we pushed up very high, and now we're only closing like 20%. And it's it's too much, and you realize you, it, people just cannot 
afford that price in your audience. So then you might say, drop it back down a bit. And then you found your perfect level dictated by the market. Um, Gemma says, with that testimony, what's the best way to demonstrate your expertise value that you know you could deliver? So there's a few ways. One tends to be your own story. So most people will have gone through whatever experience or problem, solve whatever problem, challenge it is, and use your own experience as your own testimonial. So I went from this to this, and you know that's how I did it. And now I help people to do the same. And you've got all the proof that you did that. Um, otherwise, you might possibly just work with the first few clients for free. So not ask for any money, just try it out with some people and actually go and get them results um, for free. So they're not having to pay you. You can just prove your worth to them. So either of those two ways tend to be the best. I've got good feedback that the um, story I told and the webinar married up. Uh, yeah, my, I, I was my own testimony until I had some. Mm -hmm. Gary says, is there still robust psychology and pricing at 9999 for 1999? Oh, you mean like the one pound? No, I find not. Not really. We don't really do the 999 thing anymore. Um, no, we just do pretty much straight up numbers. And there are a lot of people do, um, you know, the price in the hundreds can make a difference. So um, you might find like say 2,800, like 800 brackets tend to work quite well or 500s or 300s, more so than 900s or 100s, anything like that. So three, five, eight, good to test that uh, one of my friends was telling me they're apparently sevens the new nine he's, he, he's working on seven being the new nine so instead of uh one nine nine it's one nine seven i was like dude really yeah. <laughs> got Walmart, okay let me know how that goes and asda to thank for that yeah <laughs> he's rolling back prices yeah Dr. Allen says, created a Facebook account a couple of days ago, tried to log in for the first time and asked for photo ID, then asked for an email address to send a pass number to verify ID, then never sent an email. Mm. Yeah, maybe just reach out to their support. It can be a bit tricky setting up an account initially. Mm. Obviously not something I've done for a long time. Is it, Any um, other questions? Is that a business or private pro, pro, profile? Because I had this with... Um a business page in one of my previous jobs. We got locked it's out like of our... It's like a personal um, profile. This, this personal profile. photo ID is your personal profile. Yeah, with the business, you'd have to send in your business registration. Yeah. It was all, all very complicated. Mm -hmm. All right. Cool, cool. Seems to be a wrap. So I hope you found that useful. Just a bit of insight. Um, just to add that extra oomph to your offers without adding extra cost. What's coming up next week? Next week, we've got a fun one for you guys. We've got Pete Can, the laughter man. Um, so, yeah, be prepared to come on camera because he likes to see all your smiley faces. Uh, Pete's a good friend of mine from many years ago who, um, like many people in the hospitality trade, got shut down during lockdown and turned his world around and became a laughter yogi. So he teaches laughter yoga, and he's going to talk to you all about how he... Uh, turned his life around with a little bit of a giggle so yeah be prepared for a chuckle next week guys they're already laughing this is a good start this is a good yeah, start man. yeah that sounds really cool i was like laughter what what but then i looked into it and i was like actually this looks really awesome so yeah my, my introduction to it was at a festival walking through walking through an everglade with a coconut full of rum and i just heard a lot of laughing i thought what's going on <laughs> i'm a trauma type drunk and there, there was a group of about 80 people doing laughter yoga. I was like, this is crazy. But it, yeah, it's, it just consumes you. It's, it's brilliant. And what a, better way, what a better way to start the day than having a good old giggle. 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so it's going to add a ray of sunshine to your miserable lives, everybody. <laughs> Even Ben is laughing. Look, it's the first time I've seen him do that in a while. Three. <laughs> Awesome. Cool. I'm really looking forward to it. So, yeah, yeah I'll man. catch you guys next week then. So, yeah, we'll be back next week at 9.30 UK time. See you later, guys. See you later, gang. See you soon. Bye now.